All right. Okay. So to start, just to kind of give a, an overview of the endocrine system, obviously, like we talked about, we're going to really focus a lot on the thyroid and then the mutation towards the end that um, Betty has. But just to give an overview of the endocrine system. So the endocrine system is a series of glands that produce and secrete hormones that the body uses for a wide range of functions. These control many different bodily functions including respiration, metabolism, reproduction, sensory perception, movement, sexual development, and growth. The hormones that are produced by the glands and sent into the bloodstream by the, to the various tissues in the body. They send signals to those tissues to tell them what they're supposed to do. When the glands do not produce the right amount of hormones, diseases develop that can affect many aspects of life. The main hormone producing glands um, within the endocrine system are the hypothalamus. So this is responsible for body temperature, hunger, moods, and the release of hormones from other glands. Also controls thirst, sleep, and sex drive. The pituitary gland is considered the master control gland. This controls other glands and makes the hormones that trigger growth. The parathyroid, this gland controls the amount of calcium in the body. The pancreas uh, produces the insulin that helps control blood sugar levels. The thyroid, which we're obviously gonna go into a lot more depth, uh, produces the hormones associated with calorie burning and heart rate. Adrenal, um, the adrenal glands produce the hormones that control sex drive and cortisol and the stress hormone. The penile gland produces melatonin, which affects sleep. Ovaries, which is obviously only in women, um, secrete estrogen, testosterone, and progesterone, um, also the female, which are the female sex hormones. And the testes gland, which is only in men, produce the male sex hormone, testosterone, and also produce sperm. Some of the factors that affect the endocrine organs include aging, certain diseases and conditions, stress, the environment, and genetics. So to jump into the thyroid, what is the thyroid gland? So it produces hormones associated with calorie burning and heart rate, as I mentioned. It's found in both men and women, and it controls a person's metabolism. It's located in the front of the neck, as that image on the screen shows. It secretes hormones that govern many of the functions in the body, such as the way we use energy, consume oxygen, and produce heat. Thyroid disorders typically occur when the gland releases too many or too few hormones. An overactive or underactive thyroid can lead to a wide range of health problems. The thyroid hormones regulate vital bodily organs and functions. Um, it controls breathing, heart rate, central and peripheral nervous systems, body weight, muscle strength, menstrual cycles, body temperature, cholesterol levels, um, so as you can see, it really has a lot of purpose. So when there is dysfunction within this area, it's very concerning. The thyroid gland also uses iodine from the foods that you eat to make and produce two main hormones, T3 and T4. Um, not to get into too much specifics because it can probably be a, a week course in, in med school, as I'm sure Dr. Kent would say, but it's important that these two levels of the T3 and T4 are neither too high or too low. Um, the two glands in the brain, the hypothalamus and the pituitary communicate to keep these in balance. Um, the hypothalamus produces the TRH, which is um, a releasing hormone that single, sing, signals the pituitary to tell the thyroid gland to produce more or less of the T3 and T4. So they either increase or decrease the release of the amount of hormone. When the T3 and T4 levels are low in the blood, the pituitary gland releases more of the TSH to tell the thyroid gland to produce more thyroid hormones. Um, if it's too high, it tells them to, to slow down the production. So the T3 and the T4 travel in the bloodstream to reach almost every cell in the body. It regulates the speed with which the cells and metabolism work. So for example, T3 and T4 regulate your heart rate and how fast your intestines process food. So if the T3 and T4 levels are low, your heart rate may be slower than normal and you may have constipation or weight gain. If T3 and T4 levels are high, you may have a rapid heart rate or diarrhea and weight loss. 
So issues with the thyroid can really affect behavioral health symptoms. So the seven dwarfs of thyroid disease. Um, thyroid disease can affect your mood, primarily causing either anxiety or depression. Um, generally, the more severe the thyroid disease, the more severe the mood changes. If you have an overactive thyroid, which would be hyperthyroidism, you may experience unusual nervousness, restlessness, anxiety, or irritability. And on the opposite end of that spectrum, if you have an underactive thyroid, so hypothyroidism, you may experience mild to severe fatigue, depression, difficulties with concentration, short-term memory lapses, and a lack of interest and mental alertness. All of those conditions, especially in the population we all work with, can be obviously thought of as something else. So at times we're treating a mental health diagnosis when the underlying vulnerability causing that symptom is actually medical. And that's why really investigating the medical first, as we always say within START, is so important because we're not going to be able to rectify the behavioral health symptoms if they're caused by a thyroid condition if we're not treating the thyroid condition itself. Either overactive or underactive thyroids can cause mood swings. So irritability, snappiness, uh, short temperature, temper, which people often call moodiness, sleeping difficulties. So it really affects so many areas of someone's life. But what causes these psychological symptoms related to the thyroid? So when there's the abnormal thyroid levels, the rapid changes in those hormone levels can unsettle your emotions. So with hyperthyroidism, especially rapid and effective control of the thyroid levels is essential to stabilize the mood. It's also really important to make sure that the thyroid levels remain stable. So when they're up and down, that's causing the, the moodiness as well. Sometimes the psychological symptoms can be a side effect of treatment. So it is important to investigate that as well. Um, steroids, for example, can aggravate depression. Um, beta blockers prescribed to slow down your heart rate and to reduce anxiety if you have a hypothyroid can make some people feel more tired, depressed, and mentally less alert. Um, a thyroid disorder can also cause changes in appearance. So it can change how your eyes are functioning. It can change your weight loss or gain. It can cause loss of hair, which I'm sure all of us can understand can also cause feelings of low self-esteem or mood um, if our appearance is changing. Um, the findings show that thyroid disorders is one of the most prevalent chronic diseases among individuals with ID. In addition, with this population group suffers from this health condition more frequently than older adults without ID. So this is something that we really need to always be on alert for when working with the ID population. I just wanted to say on, on your slide, uh, Elise, a lot of times it's um, the mental health part is underappreciated by a lot of the other uh, physicians. They'll yes. think about it more in terms of the medical and say, well, you know, it's subtle. It's not that big a change in the number. So I don't think we really have to worry about that on the depression mm -hmm. or anxiety or hypomania front. But definitely, definitely, we have to advocate for that because it has it has Absolutely. a huge effect. Absolutely. Um, but OK, now to, to goiter. Goiter is an abnormal enlargement of the thyroid gland. And as you mentioned, um, it sits at the base of your neck below your Adam's apple. Usually a goiter is painless, but they can sometimes result in a cough or if more severe some difficulty in swallowing or breathing. Uh, the number one cause worldwide is iodine deficiency. In developed nations, uh, it's uh, the salt, uh, it, it's put in uh, so that there's less of a risk for, you know, certainly in developed nations like the United States. Now, it could sound confusing, but you can see a goiter from overproduction, like in Graves' disease, you can see it from underproduction of thyroid hormone. So when you see a goiter, it doesn't necessar necessarily tell you what the problem is, it tells you there's a problem. Uh, you could see it with cancer, you could see it with infection, and sometimes you can even get a benign goiter during pregnancy. Certain food items make it harder to make thyroid hormone and can lead to this. You can see this with excessive use um, in a sensitive individual to soy, tofu, cabbage, broccoli, and cauliflower. That's why whenever my wife makes it, I bring home McDonald's just so that I'm, I'm eating healthier than she is, and I have a justification <laughs> for it. Um, risk factors for a goiter, uh, lack of dietary iodine, being over 40, being female, and having a genetic history. Certain medicines put you at risk. In our population, 
definitely lithium. That's something that if you see an individual on lithium, we want to make sure that the lithium level is being monitored along with the thyroid functions. Um, because it doesn't mean you can't use the lithium. It just means you may have to supplement the thyroid hormone if necessary. Um, treatment can be by decreasing thyroid production or improving the thyroid production. Because remember I said, if it's too low, we raise it. If it's too high, we lower it. Um, and if the goiter gets really bad to the point where it's affecting breathing, swallowing, then sometimes the debulking through surgery is necessary. Okay, so to move on to hyperthyroidism. So this is a condition which the thyroid gland is overactive. It produces too much thyroid hormone. If left untreated, the hyperthyroidism can lead to a lot of other health problems. Some of the most serious involve the heart, so re rapid or irregular heartbeats or congestive heart failure, um, as well as within the bones, it can cause osteoporosis. Um, Graves' disease is the most common cause of hyperthyroidism, but this will be discussed in more depth in a future slide. Um, there are some less common causes of hyperthyroidism that we should be aware of. So thyroid nodules, which is lumps on the thyroid gland that may secrete too much thyroid hormones, um, subacute thyroiditis, a painful inflammation of the thyroid, typically caused by a virus, um, postpartum thyroiditis, so it's thyroiditis that occurs, that develops shortly after pregnancy, and there's certain medications, so cancer, immunotherapies, and, and so forth can also um, be a less common cause. So some signs and symptoms of hypothyroidism, if we're concerned about either ourselves or the people we support, they might be feeling too hot, um, increased sweating, muscle weakness, trembling hands, rapid heartbeat, tiredness or fatigue, a weight loss unexplained by other um, avenues, diarrhea or frequent bowel movements, irritability and anxiety, eye problems such as irritation or discomfort, menstrual irregularities, and infertility. So hypothyroidism means that you have too little thyroid hormone. Another term is an underactive thyroid. So this is the most common thyroid disorder. It occurs more often in women and people over the age of 60. Hypothyroidism tends to run in families as well. Some symptoms of hypothyroidism include tiredness or sluggishness, mental depression, feeling cold, weight gain, but only about five to 10 pounds, dry skin and hair, as well as hair loss, constipation, and menstrual irregularities. Obviously these symptoms are not unique to simply hypothyroidism. There's a lot of overlap. So a simple blood test can tell you whether the symptoms are due to hypothyroidism or another cause. And people with mild hypothyroidism may not even have any symptoms at all. So what causes hypothyroidism? In adults, Hashimoto's disease is the most common cause of hypothyroidism in industrialized um, countries such as ours. This will be discussed more in a future slide. Hypothyroidism can also be caused by radioactive iodine treatment or surgery on the, the thyroid gland, which could be used to treat other thyroid disorders. Um, a problem with the pituitary gland is another rare cause. Um, and congenital hypothyroidism is present from birth and occurs when the thyroid gland does not develop properly, but we're also gonna talk about that in more depth. So in adults, if left untreated, hypothyroidism will lead to poor mental and physical performance. It can also cause high uh, blood cholesterol levels and can lead to heart disease. A life-threatening condition called myxedema um, can develop a severe hypothyroidism if left untreated as well. The diagnosis of hypothyroidism is especially important in pregnancy. If it's untreated, the mother may affect the baby's growth and brain development. Um, at birth, all babies are tested for hypothyroidism and if not treated promptly, a child with hypothyroidism could have an intellectual disability or fail to grow normally. So it's one of the a really large cause of uh, intellectual disabilities that we're aware of and that's actually preventable. Um, in regards to heart health, studies show that hypothyroidism can also increase the risk for heart disease. The thyroid hormones affect heart rate and how much blood is pumped by the heart. It also increases the risk for higher levels of bad cholesterol, triglycerides, and other fats related to heart disease. In addition, uh, pericardial effusion, which is fluid around the heart, and congestive heart failure, which is the inability to heart, for the heart to pump blood forward, are also poss possible heart conditions that may develop with severe hypothyroidism. 
Potential problems also may include high blood pressure, heart enlargement, increased strain on the heart, and stiffness of the blood vessel walls, as well as a low heart rate. To lower the risk of heart-related problems due to hypothyroidism, it's important to schedule routine checkups and monitor the blood pressure, as well as cholesterol levels. If left untreated, problems can occur from the heart disease. Um, it can include, include congestive heart failure, heart attacks, strokes, artery disease, and sudden cardi cardiac arrest. So it's very serious to not treat um, hypothyroidism. It's important to also make regular appointments with doctors to check blood pressure, cholesterol levels, make sure your heart is being checked if you do have hypothyroidism. I just wanted to follow up on the, on the weight thing. When someone's hypothyroid, uh, clearly they can gain weight, but ask about diet. With doing telemedicine, I had someone a couple of weeks ago where the woman was telling me she, her thyroid's low and she's putting on all this quarantine weight and you know, they got to check her Synthroid and her husband uh, very cutely comes into the picture and says, hey, honey, do you think these Dove bars have anything to do with it? And then walks back to the freezer. So um, yes, it does, but it's not always as significant. So we have to make sure what the dietary intake of our individuals are as well. Absolutely. Um, uh, a Dove bar a night will definitely, definitely add to, add to it. Um, Hashimoto's. <laughs> It's an autoimmune disease where the body attacks the thyroid. At first, there's usually a leakage out of hormones and you may actually see hyperthyroidism, a little high. Then the thyroid burns out and the person ultimately will be hypothyroid and require replacement. The reason this is such a, a, a tricky disorder, it doesn't always run a simple straightforward case. Of course, you can have cycling episodes where it's hyper, then under, and even back to hyper. Um, so this could be very confounding to a physician who needs to realize when they're evaluating the thyroid levels, it's just a, a photograph in time. It's not necessarily a predictor in Hashimoto's how it's gonna be a week from then, a month from then. It's super common. There's more than 200,000 cases reported uh, each year. And as Elise was saying, the lab tests are important, but they need to be repeated. The consistency of monitoring in Hashimoto's is essential. One thing I see in my practice is a lot of complacency when someone has this. They'll say, oh yeah, listen, I have Hashimoto's. It's no, no big deal. My doctor just told me to stay on the Synthroid. Well, some of these cycles, they may actually not only need not need the Synthroid, but they could become hyperactive because they're taking Synthroid and the Hashimoto's is going through the hyper, hyper end of the cycle. Uh, and again, as a follow-up, it does affect behavioral health symptoms. When one is on the hyper side, as she mentioned, increased heart rate, definitely more pacing. So when I hear in these consults, someone's pacing around, pacing around, I'm gonna to wanna to know what to deal with that. And when the level dips, definitely more lethargy, oversleeping and depressed mood. Um, because there's a delay sometimes between clinical presentation and labs, you can have a situation where the labs are normal and the person still feels off, uh, which is why I actually put the picture on this slide. You wanna follow the labs, but again, one particular set of labs is not necessarily accurate. Um, somebody with a history in their family or in themselves of thyroid problems, they definitely need to be followed over time and not just assume they're just hypochondriacal or complainers, because in fact, they could be dealing with cycling. Because sometimes if it's off and you go back to the doctor and the doctor sees it's normal, they'll assess that by saying, oh, you see, you're fine. You know, this is in your head, it's no big deal. Well, no, it's not in their head. It's like bipolar, right? If somebody is manic and depressed, they go through a phase where they're fine. It doesn't mean they don't have bipolar disorder. It's just where in the cycle you're catching them. So the take home message to remember about Hashimoto's is very much a moving target. Eventually it usually burns out and it's down, but it, you could see up and down, up and down for, for years even. Mm -hmm. I think that's really important for the case that we are, you know, we reviewed in the beginning because like Dawn said, um, when Betty has been to the hospital, even for behavioral health needs, her thyroid levels have always been, um, I believe you said overactive, um, but she is on medication and it's, she has known to have Hashimoto. So they make an adjustment at that moment. But what, you know, Dr. Ken is saying is that it's, it's that moment in time. So that cycling of her levels is, is likely happening and the medications aren't maybe helping it. 
Yeah, I was just going to chime in because when the mother had told me that she went into the hospital and told me the the number that they had reported, I was like, wait a second. I thought she had hypo. Like I had to go back to basics and like, Mm -hmm. and she's like, no, she does. I have no idea. But as Dr. Kent said, it really, it is kind of almost cyclic. Um, But, and again, the other kicker for her is that you were saying that it needs to be regularly monitored with labs as she only had a primary they were checking it, but she never had an endocrine. So I think that that not having that regular and and that you know focused view of kind of making sure that it was being regulated appropriately, it was much more on a reactive level where they were, oh my God, it's so high. She's getting hospitalized. She's having these behavioral yeah. health symptoms. Everything was very reactive. Yeah. I remember when we did our first consultation on this case, Dr. Kent and I both said like, I know she says she has hypothyroidism, but we think she has Hashimoto's too. <laughs> like we think that there's a cycling and we were like well, looking into it. And then you found in the record, she does have Hashimoto's and kind of all of those things came up. But again, because of the lack of appropriate medical care throughout the years, no one has been paying a very um, close attention to this. And it's it's likely part of, of what we're seeing in her presentation for her symptoms as well. And I was going to say, I didn't want to interrupt Dr. Kent before, but he was saying about how, um, you know, the the food and, and things like that for Betty, because of the CP, she definitely is very down on herself and her body image. She is shorter in stature and a little round. She's adorable, but she's a little round. Um, and I think because of one, the, the endocrine issues, um, and then the CP and not being able to move as freely and not being able to exercise and, and, you know, enjoy her body the way she wants to, um, she does not eat healthy. Um, the mom really tries to encourage it. Um, but I think it's much more of like, well, what's the point? So I think that it's kind of like a cyclic enables the depression and, and keeps kind of going. So as much as, yeah, you're eating the dove bar, but you're eating the dove bar because you're like, what's the point? So I think that definitely plays in here as well. Absolutely. Okay. So I had touched upon this very briefly earlier, but so congenital hypothyroidism or maternal hypothyroidism is a really common disorder. It affects one in 3000 newborns in the US. Um, And as I briefly mentioned as well, it represents one of the most important preventable causes of intellectual disabilities in the world today. Um, So in our field, that's really important for us to be aware of. Um, Congenital hypothyroidism can be caused by a variety of factors, only some of which are genetic, the most common cause worldwide is a shortage of iodine in the diet of the mother and then the affected infant. Um, iodine is essential in the production of thyroid hormones. Um, genetic ca- causes account for about 15 to 20% of the cases of congenital hypothyroidism. So the majority is, is non-genetic causes. Um, the most common type of congenital hypothyroidism um, is thyroid dysgenesis, Um, and it's usually unknown. Um, Studies suggest that two to 5% of the cases are inherited. Um, Two of the genes involved in this form of the condition are the PAX8 and the TSHR, um, and these genes play roles in the proper growth and development of the thyroid gland. Um, So any mutations on these genes prevent or disrupt normal development. The abnormal or missing gland cannot produce the normal amounts of thyroid um, hormones, which causes the the issues we're talking about. Um, Most cases of genetic, uh, of congenital hypothyroidism are sporadic, which means they occur in people with no history of disorder in the family. Um, Newborn screening strategies vary, but the most common practice is to measure the the T4 level first and then subsequently measure the TSH Um, level if the T4 is abnormal. Um, And like I said earlier, this is supposed to be done immediately after birth. It's one of the um, initial newborn screenings. And even in thinking about our case, Betty, since she did have um, errors, so to speak, at her birth, causing this uh, identity fund and it caused her CP, I wonder if they did a screening at birth um, or was this part of maybe what some of their mistakes were. Um, I'm not sure if we'll ever have a a clear answer unless the mother knows, but it's something that as I was even preparing the training, I was thinking, I wonder if this is part of what happened and they didn't actually test these levels appropriately. Um, There are, there is a history that the TSH and the T4 levels can be higher in the first few days of life. So 
Typically, if they're at a certain level, they're checked again before discharge, and that will represent the true hypothyroidism if it's truly a concern. Um, so if the abnormal newborn screen is identified, um, they'll continue lab evaluations of the TSH, the T4, um, and repeated um, as often as possible. Um, the infant also will be started on a medication to treat it very early on. Again, this is one of the most preventable um, causes of intellectual disability. So that treatment very early on when it's noted is really important. Also imaging studies of the thyroid might be helpful. An ultrasound um, is also important as well. Children with um, congenital hypothyroidism should also be referred to a pediatric endocrinologist for long-term care. Um, with early identification of the disease, normalization of the thyroid function within the first two to four weeks of life is possible. So compliance with treatment and the monitoring, the future is bright. And it's actually, like I said, a preventable um, method of, of not having an intellectual disability if it's treated appropriately. So it's a really important thing for all of us to be aware of. And again, just a question mark in my head if that was part of the errors made at her birth. Um, if they did not check for this or did not properly treat within those first few weeks of life. Okay, and moving on. All right, because I'm, I'm nerdy and I like trivia, to go back to that old slide, if anybody's reading in records from an older patient, it used to be called cretinism. Um, I don't think that's a politically correct term these days, but <laughs> if somebody was born with low thyroid, they were called a cretin and they had low IQ and developmental difficulties. Um, but okay, so move on to Graves. Graves is an autoimmune condition. The thyroid is clearly overproductive, common more than 3 million cases a year. Uh, typical symptoms, sweating, tremor, tremor, well, that was a New York accent, <laughs> uh, weight loss, anxiety, increased bowel movements, and skin can also be affected and be very itchy and prone to rashes. Eye complications are not as frequent, but they tend to be the hallmark symptom, as you can see from the picture that we, that we have up here, uh, and they're very associated with Graves. It could, uh, it's sometimes called ex ophthalmus, and what that means is the eyeball is protruding outward. Um, not only is it a little unsightly, it's painful, and the eyes are prone to watering. If it left to go on, if it's left to go on long enough, it actually stretches and damages the optic nerve and can cause blindness. So it's a real deal to have that uh, evaluated and treated. Now, how you treat Graves? Uh, radioactive iodine is one of the, uh, the most common. Iodine is uh, given and absorbed, and then it goes to the thyroid and the radiation is released to the cells around there and it'll destroy them. So less thyroid uh, will be, uh, hormone will be made. There are also medications on the market that will decrease thyroid functioning. Uh, and lastly, if Graves is severe enough, surgery is indicated to remove the uh, hyperactive glandular tissue. Uh, should the whole thyroid need to be removed, then that actually is, in a, in a weird way, almost simpler to treat than Hashimoto's because you know it's not going to cycle. You just give the right amount of Synthroid, you know, l whatever, <clears throat> and then they should be fairly easily regulated. Okay, thyroid storm. That's a little more rare form of hyperthyroidism <clears throat> when there's severely elevated levels. What occurs there is a drastic uh, increase in heart rate, uh, significant blood pressure raise, and tele uh, elevated temperature. Uh, these go up to such high levels that the person is uh, very much at risk. There are multiple ca uh, causes of thyroid storm. One is interesting is a uh, crush injury, like a motor vehicle accident or a... Uh, uh, you know, uh, just a physical fall or something, you know, crushing the body. That uh, basically, as you would think, causes a massive release of the hormone. You could see it following a myocardial infarction, organ failure, or even like a raging systemic infection uh, could end up in a thyroid storm. Graves disease, if it gets bad enough, uh, can do that. Prior to a better understanding of the storm, there was a super high mortality rate. In the present day, there's still a 10 to 20% loss of life if this actually happens. Um, some of the treatment is more supportive. And what that means is general care, not specific to thyroid. That would mean things like giving IV fluids and extremely importantly, lowering the body temperature. 
Uh, now, what do you do about all the all the floating around of the uh, thyroid hormone? Elise kind of alluded before to beta blockers. Those are used, and what that does is it stops the heart rate from going too fast, the blood pressure going too high. Uh, and again, antithyroid drugs are also used to bring down the level uh, of the released and circulating thyroid hormone. But if anybody is more acutely showing a very high level of these metabolic signs, you know, you can't just assume it's an anxiety, it's a, it's a panic response to trauma. If there's a thyroid history, we have to take that into consideration. All right, thyroid nodules. I put this picture in because uh, thyroid nodules most often come to light when a person feels a bump in their own neck or maybe if a doctor feels it when they're doing a routine physical examination. And of course, the human response would get to be panicky. You know, you feel a, a nodule and you're like, oh my God, what is that? Is it cancer? Uh, but for the most part, they're benign. Uh, it has to be checked out. But according to studies, uh, Cleveland Clinic, the most recent, about 95% of, of them are benign. Some nodules can secrete uh, excess hormone, excessive amount of hormones, which as we've said before, would lead to hyperthyroidism. But again, it could just as likely cause no problems and you just leave it there and, and follow it that it doesn't get too big. The theory is that most of these nodules are just a simple overgrowth of normal tissue. There's definitely a genetic predisposition and they can be associated with the beginnings of Hashimoto's, which we talked about before. Diet and thyroid nodules is controversial, but when I started to mention before, certain foods are associated with more thyroid tissue growth, that is true, and they have to watch out for excessive eating of cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, spinach, uh, and I will clearly never get a thyroid nodule from any of those things, but that is uh, a possibility for people. Now, Types of nodules, one is called colloid, C-O-L-L-O-I-D. This is an overgrowth of norm, normal thyroid tissue. It is not cancerous and they never spread. So the only reason that would become more of a medical concern is if the size of it is too bulky and it's pressing on structures and needs to be watched. A second is a thyroid cyst. Now cyst by definition is a walled off sack of fluid and you then would do an ultrasound to check that out and they are generally benign. Inflammatory nodules. This could be the result of long-term inflammation and swelling. They have a tendency to be a little more painful. And the last is what's called hyperfunctioning thyroid nodules. These are autoimmune produced growths that are making excessive amount of hormone and can lead to something as, uh, as noted before, like a full-blown Graves disease. So as Dr. Kent said, the nodules are 95% not um, malignant, they're benign, but thyroid cancer does still exist. Um, it is also the most common endocrine system cancer, um, and it occurs when cancerous tumors or nodules grow on that thyroid gland. Um, it is also the fastest growing cancer in the United States um, in both men and women with over 62,000 new cases diagnosed each year. Um, because of the increased number of thyroid cancers in the U.S., knowing the signs and symptoms is really important. Um, as we talked about with the nodules, thyroid cancer uh, occurs when the nodules become cancerous. Um, they are 95% not cancerous, but those 5% is, is very dangerous. Um, it needs to be treated um, quickly to, prevent, to protect thyroid function and prevent the cancer from spreading. Um, unfortunately, many cases of thyroid cancer do not have many symptoms. The most common is that lump or swelling in the neck, um, potentially difficulty swallowing, throat pain, or chronically hoarse voice, um, or also symptoms of the disease. Um, the swollen lymph, lymph nodes in the neck or chronic neck and uh, throat pain can also point to thyroid cancer as well. Um, if you or your doctor find a lump or nodule in your thyroid gland, it'll be monitored for signs of growth. Um, they may also order an ultrasound to evaluate the characteristics and a potential biopsy if necessary. Um, while anyone can develop thyroid cancer, certain factors do put an individual at higher risk. Um, so these are being between the age of 25 and 65, being female, being Caucasian, having a family member who has thyroid disease, 
having exposure to radiation, especially as a child. So the radiation exposure could come from exposure to a nuclear accident or even radiation treatments um, from another cancer. Um, survivors of childhood cancer who were treated with high dose radiation have a greater risk of thyroid cancers from this radiation treatment. Um, thyroid cancer risk is approximately three times higher in women than men, um, and most cases occur in patients under 55. Um, there are four different types of thyroid cancers that I'll briefly explain. So papillary is the most common. It's about 80% 80, 80 of cases. It's slow growing. Um, it may de develop in one or both lobes of the thyroid gland, and it may spread to the lymph nodes in the neck. The focular is the second most common. It's found in more countries with lack of iodine. It does grow slowly and it's highly treatable. The modular is less common. Um, more likely to run in families though, and more likely to spread to the lymph nodes and other organs. And anaplastic, which is very rare, but also very aggressive. Um, and it quickly spreads to other parts of the neck and body. All right, so I'm gonna give just a, a brief overview on some thyroid tests that help to evaluate the condition. Thyroid peroxidase antibody is an enzyme normally found in the thyroid it plays an important role in producing thyroid hormones, the T3 and T4. The TPO test looks for antibodies against it in the blood. And the reason that's an important one to throw out, a lot of people just think of T3 and T4 and TSH, but this is a kicker to this. And this is another a, a hormone that has to be uh, looked at. The presence of these antibodies suggests that we're seeing thyroid disease uh, of an autoimmune nature, such as Hashimoto's or Graves. Uh, ultrasounds, I think everybody's pretty familiar with. What these are good for is looking at fluid-filled structures. So it's often used to look at thyroid cysts and the particular cancer types. Thyroid scan can use nuclear medicine that involves the emission of gamma rays from radioactive iodine to help determine what's the cause of the patient's thyroid problem. What it does is it gives us a picture of the structure and lights up those areas that absorb the iodine. So you see structure and functioning. It's a big help in determining the size, shape, and position of the growth and the gland itself. The radioactive iodine is injected into the arm and then allowed to circulate and be absorbed into the thyroid when it's scanned. Biopsy, I think is fairly obvious. A portion of the tissue is taken surgically and sent to the lab <clears throat> excuse me, and the cell structure is looked at to see whether it's a benign overgrowth or in fact cancer. As far as lab tests, thyroid stimulating hormone, that's released by the pituitary and that's what turns the thyroid on and off. If the thyroid stimulating hormone is high, that usually shows the thyroid's not making enough and the pituitary is trying to tell it, hey, let's do some more, you guys, you know, we're, we're running low on the thyroid hormone. If the thyroid is normal or hyperactive, then you would expect the thyroid stimulating hormone to be reduced. If there's not a match between those two, then one looks at something else going on. Maybe there's a pituitary adenoma or a tumor that inappropriately is just kicking out all this TSH, or maybe that TPO test is off so that it's uh, not working as well, that there's something else going on. Uh, so the TSH is also super important to, to measure. T3 and T4, as Elise said, are the thyroid hormones you most commonly hear about. They're fairly easily measured in the blood to see if they're at proper levels. Generally, they're more accurate um, if you measure them in the morning without eating. Thyroid globulins are a protein that are made within the thyroid and used to make hormone. They tend to be a good marker to see if thyroid cancer is under control. If they remain elevated, it could show that cancerous tissue still remains and is churning out excessive amount of these globulins. Complicating the measuring of the globulins is that the body tends to make antibodies against it in autoimmune diseases like Hashimoto, and that can skew the numbers. Um, so just because they're low in someone with Hashimoto's doesn't mean the cancer is fixed. It just means that the numbers are down. So there's a wide range of what's normal on lab testing, and you often will see uh, this tested when you look at thyroid labs, in addition to the more well-known T3, T4, and TSH. And this kind of goes back to what Don said, that an endocrinologist is super helpful because what I learned in med school is true knowledge is knowing what you don't know. And if it gets complicated uh, and it's not a simple thing, 
you're better off having a uh, specialist that does this all day, take a look at it and make sure we're not missing anything in the lab testing. And the, the last thing I wanna point out are the CT, the MRI and the PET scans. These are scans, CT of course being the CAT scan, everyone knows MRI magnetic waves and the PET scan uses a special dye with radioactive tracers. These are swallowed, inhaled or injected and these tracers help the doctor to see how the organs are functioning. The tracer will collect in areas of high chemical activity, which is helpful because certain tissues of the body, such as the thyroid, may have a higher level of chemical activity if there is an autoimmune or cancerous process going on. So where this is an advantage over just a normal scan is you're not just getting a picture, you're getting a picture and an assessment of functioning at that moment. The biggest drawer, uh, down drawer of a uh, PET scan is they're expensive and you can't always get them covered. All right, doctor treat, uh, doctor treatments, thyroid treatments. Doctor Who is more, more nerdy stuff that I like. So I just shoved that on there. Um, so how do you treat thyroid problems? Well, as we talked about before surgery, of course an option for thyroid cancer or for severe autoimmune disease if the thyroid is getting too big. Uh, partial or full thyroidectomies are done. Fortunately, thyroid replacement, as I said, is manageable and the person can live very, very well just taking their thyroid replacement. Antithyroid medications are used to treat hyperthyroidism caused by Graves. They work by blocking the formation of the hormone in the gland. It's important to note that these medicines can take a couple of months to work. So people generally stay on them for at least a year, year and a half. Um, so if someone takes it, don't expect the improvement to be immediate. Uh, methimazole, purple thiourosol, those are a couple of names you might hear. The biggest side effect and concern in these is liver functioning. They could be toxic to the liver. Patient also has to look out for hives, rashes, and allergic reactions. Uh, the other not common but significant concern is something called agranulocytosis. That's a big deal. That's when the white blood cell uh, production is impaired and the person could be at deadly risk to uh, infection. So uh, if somebody is getting these meds, they have to have their white blood cell count uh, followed. Radioactive iodine can help shrink the thyroid and decrease the hyperthyroidism. There are oral preparations and it can take several months to work. One of course has to watch out for turning them into being hypothyroid, but again, that's treatable, not the end of the world. Treating with radioactive iodine has been in existence for almost 50 years. And it's a very simple, manageable form of treatment. Uh, thyroid replacement, as we've noted a couple of slides, is easy to use if it's monitored properly. Synthroid's the brand name. And I'm going to bring that up because this is such a common thing. The generic on this medicine is not as good. I cannot tell you why. It's not as reliable. Um, try to explain that to the insurance companies. They do not care. I, I write letters of appeal. I even go as far as ordering for Canada, from Canada from a lot of my patients. Um, but this is one that if you see someone and they're not well regulated, check out if they're on the brand because this is not necessarily a complaining person. Um, this is just factual. You ask any endocrinologist, they do not like people to take the generic if they can avoid it. Um, recombinant human TSH is essentially synthetic thyroid stimulating hormone. It's been around since the 90s. It's a way, another way of getting the thyroid to produce more hormone when it's low when there's uh, pituitary insufficiency, that's maybe when they look towards the uh, recombinant uh, human TSH. Okay, so we are going to move towards um, the MTHFR mutation, which at first glance, it might look like a curse word, um, but it actually refers to a relatively common genetic mutation. It stands for, and I've been practicing this, Methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase. I got it. <laughs> Which is a genetic mutation that may lead to high levels um, of homeocysteine in the blood and low levels of folate and other vitamins. Um, so our bodies are made up of trillions of cells, each containing our genes, um, the set of instructions for making who we are. Um, genes are segments of DNA, and each gene provides a particular set of instructions, usually coding for a specific protein or a particular function. Um, humans have an estimated 20,000 genes, and one of those is the MTHFR gene. 
unfortunately, 30 to 60% of all people carry the MTHFR gene variant, putting them at higher risk for preventable heart disease, colon cancer, strokes, Alzheimer's disease, and more. So what exactly is this mutation? Um, so the MTHFR is a gene that provides the body with instructions for making a certain enzyme called methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase. Uh, when you eat foods that contain folic acid, the MTHFR converts it into methylfolate, which is the folate's active form. Methylfolate is critical to methylation, which helps to optimize a huge number of processes in the body, including the production of DNA, metabolism of hormones, and proper detoxification. Um, there can be one abnormal variant, which is called a heterozygous, or two, which is a homozygous, which are passed down from parent to child. The more variations you have, the more issues your body will have with the um, methylfolate. The MTHFR gene mutation may change the way you metabolize and convert nutrients from your diet into active vitamins, minerals, and proteins that your body can use. So this genetic, muta genetic mutation may also affect hormones and neurotransmitter levels, brain function, digestion, cholesterol levels, and more. Um, so as I said, there are variants to the MTHFR mutation. You can either have one or two or neither on the MTHFR gene um, the variant is part of the gene's DNA that's commonly different or varies from person to person. Um, having one variant, so as I said, that's called heterozygous, is less likely con to contribute to health issues. Um, and homozygous, which is having two variants, may lead to more serious problems. Um, even with the homozygous variant, it's not a guarantee that you will have health concerns, although it is more likely. Um, so just to go over, there are a lot of risks associated with the MTHFR mutation. So it may increase the risk of learning disorders, mood disorders, fibromyalgia, neurodegeneration, heart disease, digestive problems, addictive behaviors, Down syndrome, um, autoimmunity, and chronic fatigue. Um, what's interesting is that obviously Betty, we've talked about, has this mutation. She has chronic pain that's really not able to be explained. Um, so it's, it's possible that it is, has the MTHFR mutation has increased her risk of, of some of those pain disorders that I mentioned, um, that are not, haven't been really explored yet. And just to clarify, she is homozygous. We were able homozygous. to ascertain from her, um, genetic testing. We reviewed that during the, the review. So for everyone else, she is homozygous. Um, yes. they were able to provide us with some genetic testing. Thank you. So yeah, so she is more likely to have severe problems related to the MTHFR mutation because she is homozygous. So um, before we even had, I had even realized that the MTHFR gene mutation may increase the risk of fibromyalgia. Specifically, I actually mentioned it in um, a consultation that how she describes her pain, it potentially could be a chronic pain condition such as fibromyalgia, which is very difficult to diagnose as well as treat. So it's something that I know we, is on our radar. All right, just to follow up to explain a little more detail about that enzyme, folic acid or folate, which is the natural occurring B vitamin, what that enzyme does, it turns it into something called L-methylfolate. And when you have a blockage, L-methylfolate is the form that gets into your brain. So it's not so much that they both get in there, but the other doesn't work. This literally does not get into your brain to do its thing. It must be converted down to L-methylfolate. Um, this topic is dear to my heart. My oldest daughter has this um, and she has celiac. So she's convinced I married my first cousin and she has all these weird genetic things, which I did not. Um, but it's a, a, it's a very common mutation. And I think Elise did a good job because you don't want to assume because they have it, there is a problem. Now the homozygous is clearly more likely, but there are actually now tests that could measure the efficacy of the hormone, even if you're homozygous. So that you could go to a geneticist and say, hey, listen, I have a homozygous mutation. How much of my actual enzyme is working? And they could tell you, oh, you have 5% efficacy, 50% efficacy. So it's worth following up on um, if, if you have it. Um, one of the things that it's extremely important that you're at risk for is clotting issues. 
And that's actually how in my family, we found it out. She got a DVT on a plane ride, which, and, and she was young, we never thought about it. Um, individual, individuals at great risk for stroke, heart attack, and as I mentioned, DVTs. Uh, they need to know this, stay hydrated, not sit in one spot for too long, which is really important in our population that they're not just left in a chair or not getting out and getting the movement that they need to get. Uh, they need to get up, walk around if possible. And again, on long car rides or, or airplane rides, take it seriously. Smoking and being on the birth control pill are a loaded gun for these people. They should not be doing those things. It just really increases the risk of the mutation. And interestingly, I don't know with the COVID vaccine, if they're gonna be considered higher tier for the uh, vaccine, but it makes some sense to me because COVID is highly associated with clotting difficulties. So uh, I'm certainly thinking that that might uh, make some sense to be in the earlier round of vaccination. Although you get probably all these people with the heterozygous where it doesn't mean anything and they're all gonna run forward for the vaccine. Um, Elise kind of mentioned the behavioral health stuff. Uh, this is very general. I, I mean, what's reported a mood disorder is anxiety, even fogginess and executive functioning. Uh, for my kid, she was a lot more uh, calm. And I think I said it the wrong way. I said, well, wow, you're so much easier to get along with since you've taken the folate, the, the L-methyl folate. That didn't go over big, but it did help. Um, the one you might've heard advertised is Deplin. That's the brand name version of it, of L-methyl folate replacement. And when you think about Deplin, it was FDA approved for enhancement of mood. So when they did that, they weren't even testing for MTHR. Uh, they were just contemplating this as a supplement for mood disorder. It, pr it proved efficacious. No one's ever going to do it, but I would love them to go back to their original studies and find out what percent of that population had the, uh, the heterozygous or the homozygous mutation. Um, so even if you don't have it, it's actually used to help out with depression. So that just gives further credence to the fact that MTHFR should be taken seriously. Neurologic, you could see things like paresthesias, which is tingling in the extremities, dizziness, impaired coordination, and rarely even seizures. Hormonal issues are also noted. Dysmenorrhea is not uncommon. It could be a heavier flow, erratic schedule. Uh, it's associated with thyroid abnormalities. And lastly, hematologic and immune difficulties are reported. There could be difficulty in fighting infection due to decreased white blood cell count and decreased immunoglobulin production. And lastly, enhanced allergic response is also seen in people with MTHFR. All right, treatments. Back to my, it looks like I'm obsessing on greenery today. It's come up a couple of times. I didn't realize that as I put this together. Um, supportive care, as I said before, is a way to treat in a general way, any problem that exists. So this is no different for MTHFR. So if they're having neurologic problems, psychiatric, endocrinological, these need to be taken care of regardless of the uh, L-methyl folate. If there is a severe, severe homozygous mutation and very minimal enzyme activity, then we have to look at the diet that I was joking about before. These people truly cannot eat a ton of folic acid rich foods. They counterintuitively have to be told to cut back on green leafy vegetables, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, kale, spinach, chickpeas, kidney beans. Um, and we also don't think about breakfast cereal and bread, but a lot of them in this country are fortified with folic acid. They can't have that because what happens is, remember it's not getting broken down to L-methyl folate. So the body's getting an excessive amount of folic acid and that's not healthy that can cause a whole lot of medical issues. Um, the MCHR not working um, can cause this to back up in the liver. You could have liver function problems. You see a high level of something called homocysteine. Um, that also can be critical. It's really bad in pregnancy. So if someone is pregnant and has an MTHFR mutation, that needs to be measured. Um, they have to take B6, B12, and the L-methyl folate. Um, too much homocysteine, which by the way is an amino acid, a building block of protein. It can impact the eyes, uh, blood clots, bone weakness, and in young children, uh, developmental deformities such as pectus excavatum, if people have heard of that's that dent in the chest where it's kind of caved in and learning disabilities have been reported. Uh, homocysteine 
is uh, gotten from protein products. So you don't want to have someone eating excessive a lot of heavy duty proteins. Um, while homocysteine is high in MTHFR, meth, uh, methionine, which is another amino acid, tends to be on the lower side. So as the opposite of that, that needs to be a supplement that's also taken. And what methionine is used for is an antioxidant. That helps the body fight off uh, and detoxify cancer prevention, uh, infection. So methionine, uh, if somebody uh, has homocystinuria, which is too high, and the MTHFR, they want to reduce the amount of folic acid, but up the B6, B12, and methionine. You know, it sounds a little confusing, but it's something that simply could be read and followed, and, and uh, the physician, if they're aware of it, um, you know, needs to take care of it. I'm finding over the last few years, it's becoming a little more mainstream. Years ago, a lot of physicians didn't know about it. I wasn't really taught about it much in med school, uh, but now it's really, it's really out there more. Mm -hmm. Okay.